What is the Jehovah Witness movement and how did it begin? All right. Okay. So um, obviously there is a lot to unpack here. So I'm going to try to make this as brief as possible. But that just so that everybody will, will know that um, the reason we know these things is because we do training on Living Waters Europe and we do we teach people how to go out there and evangelize. And part of that training includes teaching on Mormonism, uh, Jehovah's Witnesses, uh, Islam and various other things. So this is obviously an extension of what we do. So it's qu quite normal for us to, to do talks and studies like this. I'll try to keep this as brief as possible, but it won't be very brief. And I'll give you some background towards their beliefs as well. Uh, first of all, let me start by saying that Jehovah's Witnesses are one of the most genuine and nice people you'll ever meet. And that is a true fact. They really want to please God in their lives. They really want to show good fruit. They want to do the right thing, no matter what the cost is. They love God who they call Jehovah, of course, and love Jesus, their, in, in their intentions are good. Yeah, they're very devoted. So how did it all start? Well, it started in the 19th century in America by a guy called Charles Taze Russell. Most people would know that. His followers were, this is what most people would probably not know, his followers were general, uh, originally called the Russellites mm. uh, for obvious reasons. Uh, sometimes they were called the Millennial Donists because Charles Russell uh, wrote a six volume book, te uh, a textbook, uh, which had the name Millennial Dawn, which later got changed to studies in the scriptures. And this is going to be very important and is very important for Jehovah's Witnesses. And sometimes they were called the International Bible Students because they also started the Bible Student uh, Study Group called the International Bible Students Association, which happened in 1972 in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. So this guy was a very busy boy. Uh, they were not called Jehovah's Witnesses until 1931. That's uh, long after he died in 1916. So Charles Russell uh, was brought up in a Christian home in a congregational church, but walked away from it at a young age uh, in, as early, in his early teens. Uh, some say when he was 16 because he couldn't reconcile uh, eternal hell with God's mercy. He also had problems with the Trinity and he couldn't get his head around it. But when he was about 17 or 18 years old, round about in the 1870, uh, he met a group of Adventists in Pittsburgh. Uh, apparently he got inspired by their teaching and had and this kind of renewed his zeal and belief that the Bible is the word of God. Anyway. As you would guess, the Adventists are very much interested in looking into the second coming of Jesus. In fact, they were so obsessed with it, they would set dates for it. At that time, they were already saying that Christ had returned to the earth invisibly. So Charles Russell got interested in all this. A few years later, in 1879, he started publishing his own teachings in a magazine he called the Zion's Watchtower and Herald of Christ's Presence. That's how more people got to know him and got interested in his teachings. About 40 years later, 1909, um, the name of his magazine got changed to the Watchtower of Herald of Christ's Presence, so he dropped out the word Zions from the name. And 30 years after that, in 1939, which is many years after Charles Russell dies, which was in 1916, the magazine got changed again with the name that we know that we, we know it by now, which is the Watcher, the sorry, the Watchtower announcing Jehovah's Kingdom. So don't confuse these names or this name with the organization that produces or publishes this magazine, who are called the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society of Pennsylvania. That started in 1881 in New York. So they were called by many names, the Russellites, the Millennial Donors, the International Bible Students, but never Jehovah's Witnesses. That came later. So. Charles Russell denied more or less every major Christian doctrine. Again, I, I know we're going to get into this later on. He denied the Trinity and hell. Uh, he said that all the historic creeds were false teachings like the Apostle Creed. Uh, things that Christians believed since the beginning are all from the devil. In the days of the apostles, he would have been rejected as the Antichrist. You'll see later why when we get into the details of all this. He managed to dedicate his entire life to his cause by selling his father's very large clothing business. His father was very rich mm. in many sites and he inherited a lot of money to fund his uh, publishing work. Now one of, the Char one of Charles Russell's famous achievement is that he wrote this six volume book called Studies in the Scriptures. It, it was his own interpretation of the Bible. 
this is going to shock you. After he wrote these books, starting from 1886, he told his students, now listen to this, these are the students who were attending as Bible students, to stop studying the Bible and use his writings instead. This attitude of don't study the Bible, but instead study our material, sadly became, sadly is the thing they continue doing today. In fact, the Watchtower in 1910 on page 298, I've got those quotes in front of me, so I'm going to read them. Um, they, they made these comments about these writings. They said, the six volumes of scripture studies that's the name of the book, are practically the Bible topically arranged with the Bible proof texts given. They are not merely comments on the Bible, but they are practically the Bible itself. So this is the attitude of Jehovah's Witnesses towards these writings. Um, anyway, this is where it gets interesting. When Charles Russell died in 1916, Judge Rutherford, Rutherford uh, full name is Joseph Franklin Rutherford, took over in 1917. And uh, many years later, in 1931, he officially changed the name uh, of this organization to Jehovah's Witnesses. So he's the guy who did it. So why did he change the name to Jehovah's Witnesses? Well, he got the idea from Isaiah 43.10, where he says, Ye are my witnesses, saith Jehovah. What better reason to have than this? But what is interesting that the word Jehovah here is specifically in the ASV translation, the American Senate version. You won't find this in many other versions. I think it's probably unique to that one. It's a terrible translation because the actual word used here is not Jehovah. It uses the tetragrammaton uh, four-letter Hebrew word, which is YHWH, which is normally translated into English in every single translation that I know of, into Lord, the capital L-O-R-D. I'm sure you're familiar with that. In every other English translation of the Bible, that it appears that way. Anyway, after Judge Rutherford took over from Charles Russell in 1917, he made many more changes in this organization. In fact, probably most of the key teachings that JW follow are the stuff, or, or the stuff that we know about, um, probably came from him. For example, Charles Russell, and this is going to surprise some people here, for example, would happily celebrate and encourage people to celebrate birthdays. He, he would happily do Christmas, for example. Um, but George Rutherford didn't like it. He called it pagan practices, so he told them to stop doing it. And these things happen a lot in uh, in JW's kind of organization. Things change all the time. After that, in 1942, a new guy comes along. His name is Nathan Homer Knorr. He took over, so Judge Rutherford had a good run for about 25 years. But when Nathan Knorr came along, well, he just transformed everything. He basically flooded the Watchtower information everywhere. He did a good job at letting everybody know about their material. So I guess um, the, uh, well, JWs had just one leader at this time, right? So one leader after another. One leader took over from the previous guy. They viewed these leaders as, I guess, the way Catholics would view their Pope. They would accept his authority as the one who God spoke through, and he is God's mouthpiece, who has the authority to pass new revelations and so on. But the 1970s, probably 1976, kind of started changing a little bit for JWs. They wanted to have a group of people in charge instead of just one person who took over from the previous guy. So, we're going to cut the long story short here. They called this group, and this is going to be important throughout this, uh, me sharing things with you. They called the, the group of people the governing body. This governing body today is made of eight men. In the past, they varied between seven and 18. They live in America, in Warwick, New York headquarters. Now, this governing body decides what JWs should or should not believe today. They are literally like prophets. Right. They say they are the channel for new spiritual life. The governing body is God's spokesman. They tell the world that God will do what God wants to do, and he tells JWs what they should or should not believe. Whatever the governing body says or teaches, this becomes the gospel truth for all JWs. These men are also their guide in knowing what to do when the end of the world comes along. This is going to be important because I think later on we're going to be talking about prophecies and end of the year world situations and how to be saved for JWs, you know, things like that. Well, this is what you need to know. The quote uh, I'm going to give you now, which comes from the Watchtower 2013, page 20, for people who want to go and check it out, says this, that 
faithful, that faithful slave, this is what they call these men, by the way, faithful slave, is the channel through which Jesus is feeding his true followers, that's your JWs, in this time of the end. It is vital that we recognize the faithful slave, recognize these men. Our spiritual health and our relationship with God depend on this channel. Mm -hmm. So they're saying that the governing body replaces Jesus here on earth for the JWs. They also said in the Watchtower magazine 1981, unless we are in touch with this channel of communication that God is using, that's these men, we will not progress along the road to life, no matter how much Bible reading we do. And in case the quote wasn't clear enough, I'm going to do one more, right? Because I, I just want this to, to be hammered home. I, I need people to hear this. God can, um, God can bec be become known only through Je uh, Jehovah's channel of communication, the faithful and discreet slave. So that's their statement, the faithful and discreet slave. That's when we're talking about the governing body. We need to guard against developing a spirit of independence. By word or action, may we never challenge the channel of communication that Jehovah is using today. So it's saying, don't challenge them, don't question them, just follow everything that they say, it's for your own good. Another watchtower, and this is the last one, is we must submit to and, in, and cooperate with that slave and its legal instrument, the Watchtower Society, right? Now, the, the last bit I wanna talk about here, just before we move on, is uh, who's their authority? Uh, if you were to ask JWs, uh, they would say that the Bible is their authority, but in reality, based on these quotes I just gave you, their final authority is really the material that this governing body produces, which tells them what the Bible actually says and what they should believe. In fact, they are discouraged from reading the Bible, and this is probably where all the problem is, you know, how they can't ever find the truth because they're discouraged from getting into it. And here's a quote from 1910, page 298. If anyone lays the scripture studies aside, remember the scripture studies is this five, a six volume set of books that Charles Russell written, and goes to the Bible alone, <laughs> check out this next verse. Our experience shows that within two years, he goes into darkness. Now, what an admission to make, right? First of all, it's saying that the Bible is not their final authority, the governing body is. But more interesting, it's saying that if you use the Bible alone, what will happen? You will leave Jehovah's Witnesses within two years. What a thing to say. Basically, they're saying if you read the Bible alone, you'll find out, that all, find out about all the heresies and leave Jehovah's Witnesses. And I'll just do a couple of quotes here and we'll move on. In fact, in 1981, this Watchtower magazine on page 29, it says, they say that it is sufficient to read the Bible exclusively, either alone or in small groups at home. But strangely, through such Bible reading, they have reverted right back to the apostate doctrines <laughs> that commentators by Christendom's clergy were reaching, or sorry, teaching 100 years ago. It's saying that if you just read the Bible, and nothing else, you become exactly what Christians have always believed. You become a Trinitarian. You'll talk about the same, you, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about more about all of this in a minute, but anyway, if you want more information, uh, it's easy to go to the JW's website to, 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 uh, to, to expose all of this information. They literally have a library of information. Uh, but if you just read it without any background, it sounds Christian, right? Mm -hmm. It sounds Christian, but when you get into it, you'll find out that it isn't. So if you ever get to visit, uh, if you ever get a visit by JW, you'll probably see them use some kind of a portable device these days to quote from the material they find on this website, even videos and so on. So it's heavily used, really. But, <laughs> Is this mind blowing or what? It's, it's it, it, it explains um, why whenever you have a conversation with Jehovah Witnesses on the doorstep and you start to, to question them on the Bible, that they kind of get that, that rabbit caught in the headlights look. They don't know yep. how to answer. And they always respond with the same way. Well, we need to go back and ask our elders that question. And they never do come back. So that really explains why. It's, it's not because they've actually studied the Bible themselves. They've studied a commentary on the Bible. And they haven't come across perhaps this objection yet. And they have to go back to their leaders to find out what the, this governing body uh, kind of has to say on it. So that's absolutely, that's terrible. Yeah. You, know, you know what, Paul? They're good at knowing what they know what they know yeah 
But if you take them outside that, which we Christians should do all the time, mm -hmm. they are they are they are absolutely um, shocked by it. They actually don't know what to do with it. And sadly, you are right. They do say they're going to go and ask their leaders and come back, but they never do come back, and that's more frustrating in the first place. So you don't know. Uh, we'll talk about this later on, maybe a little bit more, how to deal with that and how to uh, find a way to uh, keep them interested in communicating with us. So we can probably do that later on. But yes, it is a big problem. Uh, but Christians shouldn't fear, fear Jehovah's Witnesses because they're only good at what they know. And anything outside that is there, um, they, they, have no, they, they have no kind of roots in their knowledge. They can't defend their faith.